Well, thanks, thanks, Marco. Uh, thanks, Catherine, for inviting me. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so, yes, my name is Simon Lord. I'm a uh, against breast cancer. Well, I think, can I call myself senior research fellow? Yeah, I can. I think so. Uh, at Oriel College. Um, I'm also in my day job, as it were, uh, a director or clinical lead of the, of the um, early phase clinical trials unit, which is the main uh, the sort of cancer drug development unit in Oxford, uh, where we put novel cancer drugs into patients. Uh, one of the largest in the UK, actually, has sort of 60 active trials at any one time, uh, which is based up the road in the church and the Department of Oncology and is uh, embedded within the university. Um, so, uh, I I'm going to talk about um, old drugs, uh, new tricks, repurposing treatments for cancer. Um, and over a long period of time, there's been a lot of interest in repositioning uh, drugs from other indications uh, as cancer treatments. And I'm going to talk a bit about why that's the case. And I'm also going to talk about uh, some, some uh, specific stories, in particular thalidomide, which I have nothing to do with, but is perhaps the sort of exemplar uh, story of drug repurposing. Um, I'm going to then talk about focus quite a lot of the talk on metformin, which is a drug that I've had a particular interest in uh, uh, in terms of the focus of my research. And then lastly, um, uh, atorvaquone, which is another drug development story for, uh, in the repurposing space that's come out of the University of Oxford. Uh, again, uh, colleagues have mainly worked on that, but it's quite interesting stuff to spend a bit of time talking. Um, so, why might we want to repurpose uh, uh, drugs from other indications as cancer treatments? Well, there's the obvious reason that uh, we want to make sure patients benefit uh, from new treatments. Um, but it's also the case that with regards to de novo drug development, it's incredibly costly to get a drug into a new indication. Uh, and a recent estimate suggests that you know, we're heading towards $1 billion on average to get a drug. Uh, into the clinic uh, uh, in the, from the commercial sector. Uh, and this outlay um, results in great expense for individual patients, uh, in some cases, and also obviously public health systems. Uh, and if you look at the US, you know, it, it's, very, it's typically 100,000 US dollars a year for a, a new patented drug uh, uh, to be used. Uh, and that cost has been steadily heading upwards uh, since the mid 1990s. Uh, and this also this all contributes to inequality of access to, to cancer treatment, of course. Uh, in particular, in, in low and middle income countries, uh, and for rare cancers where commercial returns are very limited, um, yeah, because there's not that many patients that you can treat with say, a new drug. Uh, this can be prohibitive for, for, for drug development and repurposing uh, uh, old drugs might be of a particular value in that context. Um, why is it cheaper to, to repurpose a drug than, than uh, develop a new drug? Well, firstly, uh, you can often repurpose a drug much more quickly than, than, than take one uh, develop a new chemical entity. Um, uh, for the obvious reasons that you don't have to do a lot of the studies uh, to get it into cancer patients, particularly in terms of toxicology, you don't have to develop the chemical entity itself. Uh, and then, of course, and then a lot of the, the, the clinical development work tends to be undertaken uh, in, in, uh, by academics uh, who don't then have an interest sort of in commercial returns per se. Um, but having said I mentioned there's been a lot of interest in drug repurposing, but actually there have been a lot of failures. Um, uh, 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 these are some examples. So metformin, I think, to date, we can say it's been a failure. Um, uh, we haven't found a clear indication in the cancer context. Statins, uh, hydroxychloroquine, serumin, there's many other examples. Often this has been actually because, particularly within the academic world, there's been sort of disconnected uh, development of these drugs with lots of academics looking at different aspects of the drug and not always talking to each other or having, an over, having a sort of clear overway of the drug development pathway as you would in a 
Um, so next, I'm just going to talk now, firstly, and sort of give a bit of history, really, and talk about thalidomide. As I say, I've got, I have nothing to do with this story. I'm not a hematooncologist, so I don't treat patients uh, with myeloma where thalidomide first found its um, uh, space. Um, I mean, I'm sure m most of you will be aware of the, the story of thalidomide in the 1960s. It was developed as a drug to treat nausea and, and was marketed as a treatment for morning sickness. Um, but was that in pregnancy it was then subsequently found to cause uh, fetal abnormalities um, and, and uh, uh, was taken off the market. Uh, it was a great scandal, of course. Um, now, but subsequently it was found to be uh, an effective treatment for this condition, myeloma. So myeloma is a cancer of plasma cells. These are the type of white blood cells that sit in the bone marrow. Uh, plasma cells produce antibodies and abnormal plasma cells, i.e. myelomatous plasma cells produce abnormal antibodies that can cause all sorts of problems like renal failure, uh, blood clots, etc. Now myeloma is still generally incurable, um, but there have been incredible improvements in uh, survival over the last two decades, uh, actually since I've been a medical student. Uh, so back in the 90s, if you die, like, diagnosed with myeloma, you have a few months to live in general. Now it's a number of years. Uh, and quite a lot of that is down to thalidomide. Uh, and the sequelae from finding this drug was, was, was potentially useful, was useful in this condition. So, uh, and actually, it was a, many of these stories, it was sort of serendipitous. So, in, in 1997, um, the wife of a patient with myeloma, I think he was actually a cardiologist, um, contacted this chap, Bar Barlogi, uh, and he treated uh, him with. And also another patient, and he saw uh, some response to treatment. Um, and encouraged by this, he then set up a clinical trial. Things were a bit easy in the 90s to do that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, and, and he treated uh, uh, 80 odd patients uh, with refractory myeloma, so you know, the, there were no standard care treatments for them at that point, uh, and saw a number of responses. Uh, and uh, following some further trials, drug development work. Um, thalidomide uh, was licensed for the treatment of myeloma and it was actually the first drug showing activity in that disease in 30 years. Um, now, you know, what, why, why did he give this patient thalidomide? Well, it, it, only a year or two earlier, uh, this guy, who, Rob DeMarta, was a young postdoc in the uh, lab in, I think, the same university, uh, uh, had shown that thalidomide could reduce blood vessel growth in the lab. And he'd, he'd done this by putting in some uh, um, pellets that contained something called basic fibroblast growth factor, which is known to stimulate blood vessel growth. And he put these into the cornea side of the eyes of anaesthetized rabbits. Uh, and he gave one group of rabbits thalidomide, and he one gave the other group uh, nothing. Uh, and uh, you can see sort of on the, on the um, right hand side uh, that in, in the lower photo of the rabbit. There's much less uh, blood vessel growth. Um, and at the time, and it still is the case actually, there's a lot of interest in targeting blood vessel growth or angiogenesis, uh, another name for it, uh, as a potential target for, for, for cancer therapy. Uh, and so uh, this group and actually others off the back of this information showed that thalidomide, at least in animal models, could shrink cancers, uh, shrink genes now. Uh, and so it was just a topical story at that time. Um, but although thalidomide was licensed for myeloma, it actually then went off and kick-started a whole new set of drug development programs. So uh, in 2004, Celgene had uh, this drug called lenalidomide, uh, which was shown actually to be more effective than thalidomide in terms of um, improving survival in, in, in myeloma patients, but also was better tolerated. Uh, this drug is still used very widely today for the treatment of myeloma, um, but it's also now been shown to be effective in some cousin cancers, myelodysplastic disorders, uh, and lymphoma as well. Um, but perhaps if we now move on to metformin, which is an ongoing area of research, um, uh, 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 an area of specific interest 
to me. Um, and I guess that some of you will know of metformin, it's very widely prescribed. It's actually first licensed in the 1950s for the treatment of type 2 diabetes in the UK, that is. Uh, and now it's the most widely prescribed oral antihyperglycemic drug, i.e., blood glucose lowering drug uh, worldwide. Uh, uh, but in the last two decades, uh, there's been great interest in metformin's potential anti cancer effect. And this was initially um, sparked by uh, a relatively small epidemiological study of, of about 12,000 patients in, in Scotland, uh, led by a group in Dundee, uh, who published in the BND, B, BMJ uh, in 2005 uh, uh, data showing that in this cohort of patients, um, the diabetic, type 2 diabetic patients that were treated with metformin compared to patients with diabetes that on insulin or, or other uh, oral hyperglycemic like blood glucose lowering drugs, uh, those who are on metformin had a, seem to have a lower cancer incidence than, than the, the other diabetic patients, the diabetic controls. Um, and subsequent to that, there are a whole load of other epidemiological studies that came out, um, including some meta analyses where they grouped together different studies that suggested um, that metformin did indeed reduce cancer incidence. I wouldn't say there was a, those were, that was a ubiquitous finding, and there's still a bit of controversy there. Um, um, but in essence, this led to uh, sort of a huge uh, amount of interest in the anti-cancer effects of metformin. Um, <clears throat> and then, so, subsequent to that, there's a lot of laboratory work using, looking at cells on plate, cancer cells on plates, and then also um, uh, in animal models that showed that metformin at least at doses many times, uh, many times greater than those that you would use in patients, did have, uh, could kill off cancer cells, could prevent proliferation of cancer cells. But also, there are a, a, a few small trials uh, whereby metformin was given to patients often before, just after they'd been um, diagnosed with a cancer. Uh, quite a those, number of those studies are in breast cancer, actually. Uh, and they looked at a biopsy taken before the patient was given metformin, so some tissue, cancer tissue, and then looked, compared it with the biopsy after, say, two to four weeks of, of uh, metformin. And um, uh, a lot of those studies looked at uh, whether metformin had an effect on cancer proliferation. So if you see over here, uh, on the left, in the left column, uh, there are these breast cancer samples have a lot of brown dots. Essentially, this has been stained with something called Key 67, which is a, uh, uh, um, a well-validated marker of proliferation. So these cancer, cancer cells are proliferating quite rapidly, growing quite rapidly. But then you give two to four weeks of metformin, and it seems there's a lot less proliferation than you can see. Um, not all the studies that there are about five or six studies like this, and not all of them show there was a significant difference in, in, in key 67 pre post metformin. But uh, there, are, there, there were two or three studies that showed that, and again, that kind of engendered, engendered greater interest in the potential of metformin uh, as an anti cancer drug. And subsequent to that, there's been over so 100 clinical trials set up worldwide in the last decade or so. Um, one of those trials, the MA32 trial was uh, just published uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, one of the biggest studies, uh, which was actually set up uh, 12 years ago. Uh, uh, and this study uh, uh, recruited over 3,500 patients with early breast cancer, so but receiving treatment with curative intent. And they were randomized either to have uh, metformin or placebo uh, following their initial treatment. Uh, now, as you can see, uh, there really was no difference in survival between the two groups. You, you can't, if you look at it, essentially this is showing uh, either uh, overall survival or uh, disease-free survival. Uh, and uh, the lines just follow each other uh, in each figure almost perfectly, which means there's no difference between the two groups in terms of their survival, i.e. metformin is not doing anything in this 
which was obviously very disappointing. Um, but I think maybe it wasn't unexpected because a lot of these big trials that were rushed, rushed into without proper preparatory work uh, at that time. Um, because back in 2010, we had very little information on how metformin worked in cancer or what biological effect it had in, in cancer. Uh, there have been no um, uh, in depth pharmacodynamic studies to look at its effects on tumor biology. We didn't even know if really what we were seeing in the lab was relevant to uh, effects on cancers in patients because the doses that we use in the lab to engender an effect are typically about 100 or 1,000 times those that you would see in patients, in diabetic patients. We didn't know really how we should select patients for a clinical trial of metformin. If, if you go for a big population and you don't select patients that are more likely to have cancers that are susceptible to a drug, you're much less likely to see a significant uh, and we also didn't really understand what, how we might combine that formula with uh, cancer treatments or other drugs. Um, what we did know, even back then, was that metformin is a mitochondrial toxin. So uh, it inhibits this thing called complex one of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. And now, mitochondria are sort of the energy powerhouses cell. And so if you uh, um, uh, interfere with mitochondria, and in particular electron transport chain, which is a key part of that uh, energy generation process, uh, one could expect to get an energy stress. And indeed, this has been shown to be the case in the lab, at any rate, in a number of elegant studies. Um, and if you cause an energy stress, that, that would impact on cancer cell proliferation. They need a lot of energy to keep proliferating. They also use mitochondria to funnel nutrients uh, um, to the main, the building blocks that they need to proliferate. So they need lots of, to generate lots of fat and DNA and things like this in order to create new cells. So uh, yeah, there was a hypothesis there, and it had been proven in the lab that metformin uh, um, did reduce proliferation because it sort of affects on, on mitochondria. But no one knew if this was really the case in patients. But there was another theory, uh, uh, hypothesis, that it was actually met, not met metformin's direct effect on cancer cells, but rather, rather metformin's effects on um, the patient's metabolism and sort of indirect effects, therefore, on, on cancer cell proliferation. So we know that metformin can reduce insulin and glucose levels in patients. It does it very well in, non, in diabetic patients, and we can also see that in non-diabetic patients as well. Um, and we also know that insulin signaling is important for cancer cell proliferation. So if you reduce insulin levels, you can potentially reduce cancer cell proliferation. Uh, um, and we also know that, um, that patients, there's some, beats some big studies that show that patients with high insulin levels, uh, the metabolic syndrome, and also we know that diabetic patients are more likely to get cancer as well. Um, so, about 10 years ago, myself and uh, Adrian Harris uh, set up a trial to try and to in interrogate in detail the effects of metformin on breast cancer, biology, and metabolism. Uh, and, and in this study, we recruited 40 women uh, with newly diagnosed breast cancer. So, they were sort of pristine, hadn't been treated with any other drugs. And we gave them typically a, a two weeks of treatment with metformin uh, before they started their standard treatment because you tend to have a sort of window up just after diagnosis of between 10 to 14 days before they start their, their, their chemotherapy for example in this situation. Uh, at either side of that uh, two week course of metformin uh, they had a series of tests uh, pre and post metformin and that included so we looked at their took blood samples so that we could Test for serum metabolic markers such as insulin and glucose, for example, for pre and post metformin. We took samples of tissue uh, from the breast cancer, so biopsies under ultrasound guidance, so that we could then look at uh, the biology of, uh, of the cancer in detail using uh, gene sequencing techniques, RNAC, uh, and also look at the metabolite profile. And then we, we carried out normal imaging, we 
performed. I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about what we found there. Um, but firstly, with regards to the, the image, this is relevant to really the, the imaging of uh, this slide that, that we carried out. So we know that um, uh, cancers in general consume a lot of uh, sugar and glucose. It was actually first observed by this guy, uh, Otto Warburg, who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine, uh, um, a German scientist, uh, uh, who first observed this 100 years ago. Um, and um, uh, at that time, Otto Warburg thought that the reason that cancer cells took up a lot of glucose was because the mitochondria were defective and therefore they needed to use a different pathway called glycolysis, which is much more inefficient to produce energy in the cell uh, um, and requires a lot of glucose. And actually, these days, it's, we think that mitochondria in general in cancer are actually they're pretty, generally pretty efficient in most cases, um, but it's, uh, and so it's not really because the cancer cells need uh, um, uh, to have uh, more sugar for energy generation, um, but, um, but rather to use that glucose and funnel it through the crossroad, through, through the uh, uh, mitochondria, which is the crossroads for, for funneling nutrients to other uh, macromolecules or building blocks and, uh, uh, such that cancer cells can proliferate by using glucose to make fats, to make DNA, um, to make protein, and other things that they need to proliferate. But in summary, cancer cells take up a lot of glucose. And this is the basis for 18F FTG PET CT scan, which we use routinely actually in the clinic, uh, which is uh, an FTG essentially is uh, uh, an analog of glucose, uh, molecule very close to the, similar to glucose but that gets trapped in, in cells once it's taken up and it's been li it's linked to a radioactive label um, and so uh, this is actually a patient with a, with a lung cancer um, who's had some chemotherapy uh, first scan is before their chemotherapy a baseline the second scan is post chemotherapy and you can see that here there's a lung cancer that's taking a lot of, uh, up a lot of um, uh, FDG, radio-labeled sort of sugar, uh, and then after they've had their chemotherapy, A, it's smaller, and B, it's metabolically a lot less active. So you can, besides using this as a diagnostic tool to determine how far the cancer has spread uh, before making decisions on surgery, for example, you can also use it as, as an early assessment of response to treatment. Uh, but we wanted to use it in a slightly different way in our trial. Um, so um, I mentioned earlier that there was this hypothesis that metformin um, uh, interfered with mitochondrial metabolism. This led to an energy stress. And the response, you would expect the response to that to be the cells will take up more sugar, more glucose. Uh, and actually, this had already been shown in the lab that if you get more, give metformin, uh, to cancer cells on a plate, or in animal models, you do see um, an increase in glucose uptake. So we thought that if we see an increase in FDG uptake in our breast cancer patients after metformin treatment, this would be an indication that the metformin is targeting mitochondrial metabolism. And um, uh, as you can see in sort of the histogram right on the right, after metformin, there was actually a significant increase in FDG uptake, increase in sugar uptake into the, into the, into the breast cancer cells. And, and if you look at the images on, on, on the left here, the uh, first one is before metformin, the one with the second one is after metformin, same patient, of course. You can see that some lymph nodes, which actually had been biopsied, so we knew they were involved in can with, uh, they had, can the patient had uh, cancer in these lymph nodes, so the primary breast cancer had spread to those lymph nodes. Um, uh, they lit up only after the patient had been given metformin because they become uh, they need they were needing to take up more glucose. I think they were because of because of the uh, 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 mitochondrial interference of the drug. Interesting, actually, you also see here there's a lot of uptake of FDG into the bowel compared to baseline. This is a phenomenon that's been known by radiologists for many years. In fact, radiologists will always say to the patient, "You need to be off your metformin." 
performing for at least 14 hours before you have a PET CT scan, otherwise you'll have no idea what's going on inside. Uh, besides the uh, imaging, as I mentioned earlier, we also took biopsies before and after metformin. Uh, so we took uh, uh, samples of the breast cancer tissue. Um, uh, and then uh, we uh, matched these samples up and we put them through a mass spec machine, like this one. And uh, we saw, we looked at what changes there might be in terms of the mitochondrial metabolites. This work was carried out by a group at the MRC Institute in Cambridge, who we, we collaborate with. Uh, and we saw in that red box, you see down there, a number of mitochondrial metabolites that had, that had decreased abundance after uh, uh, metformin treatment. Again, suggesting that uh, the metformin was, we were seeing some effect on the uh, mitochondrial biology uh, in patients uh, the treatment with metformin. Um, besides using those samples to carry out our spec, we also um, uh, carried out gene sequencing, RNA-C, to look at the activity of the genes, or expression of the genes, uh, uh, pre and post metformin. Uh, and one of the key takeaway messages here was that we strikingly saw a lot of mitochondrial genes that were upregulated that had increased activity or increased expression after metformin. Again, suggesting that maybe we, that, that, that metformin was uh, targeting the mitochondria in our, our tumours. Um, and then when we looked at the whole group of patients, we observed this um, group here uh, in the red box. That, 10 patients. Um, so it clustered together uh, and had uh, an upregulation or increased expression of a whole series uh, of mitochondrial genes that we knew were significantly upregulated in this group of patients, but almost ubiquitously. So you can see that this box is almost all red, but for the other group of patients, it's sort of a mishmash of blue and red. So red genes are upregulated in a particular patient. Uh, so each box is one patient and one gene, and blue, they're downregulated. Decreased expression, decreased activity. <coughs> uh, so it seemed that this one group of the patients were, uh, were uh, having a sort of specific uh, metabolic response, at least at the sort of genetic level. Um, and when we then looked at that group of patients and compared it to the other group, um, and, and matched it to uh, a proliferation signature. So a whole group of genes, that if you put them together, have been shown to be a very good marker of cancer cell proliferation, cancer cell growth. Uh, we saw that the group that had the increased expression of all these mitochondrial genes, this, ten, this group of 10 patients, actually benefited from after metformin had some increase in expression of this proliferation signature, suggesting that certainly their cell growth wasn't switched off at all. Uh, uh, by metformin, and that they were probably resistant to metformin's effects on proliferation. But the other group of patients, there were at least some patients where we saw a decrease in expression of this proliferation gene signature, suggesting that, that they uh, um, might, were much more liable to be sensitive to, to metformin uh, in, in the context of effects on proliferation, at any rate. Um, now, I also mentioned earlier that uh, there was this other hypothesis. That it wasn't a direct effect on uh, cancer cell mitochondria, but rather effects on patient metabolism, so insulin and, and glucose, uh, that, that might drive any anti-cancer effect in their forward. So we also looked at that. We, we had taken blood samples uh, to assess the levels of insulin uh, and glucose, uh, uh, pre and post -medical. Metformin, and that included C peptide, which is an excellent marker of insulin secretion. Right, it's a precursor molecule to insulin. Um, but here, and here we took, we looked at these different variables, uh, and we uh, correlated the change in these variables, pre and post metformin, with the change um, in expression of uh, 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 genes uh, in, in the in our genetic analysis. And, and what we saw was that um, there are a large number of genes 
that correlated both with change in FDG uptake in, in, in the patients and then also this, this mitochondrial metabolite that was very strikingly downregulated. Um, but there were very few genes in these two groups that correlated with uh, change in C-peptide or insulin levels. So it suggested that the changes in biology here were related, but they didn't seem to be, the changes in biology in the tumor didn't seem to be related to insulin. Um, it's not a perfect test. In a clinical study, you can only do sort of observational work. Um, but it suggested, at any rate, that, that the sort of mitochondrial changes that we've seen at the genetic and metabolomic level were not related to the changes in uh, patient metabolism. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a sort of precy of, of that particular study. Um, but we've got some ongoing work actually now with, with those samples uh, the, uh, and data that we've got from that study, uh, which we're, we're carrying out uh, in collaboration with Stephen Beers at the University of Southampton, and quite a bit of this work has actually been funded by the Against Breast Cancer Oral Fellowship. Um, and in this context, we're actually trying to look at the effects of forming on uh, immune cells in breast cancer. Uh, and we know that there's uh, that metabolic activity of cancer cells is, is quite abnormal compared to other tissues. I mean, I've shown you the increased uptake of glucose, for example. Um, and we also know that there's quite a lot of competition between cancer cells and immune cells in the tumor, because the tumor actually is not just cancer cells. You've got immune cells, uh, various structural cells like fibroblasts. If, if it's a breast cancer, you'll see fat cells, adipocytes, and so on. It's a whole amalgam of cells. Actually, often, it's a minority of the cells that are actually cancer cells, and actually, often, quite a large number of cells are immune cells in the tumor. Um, but they compete with the, the immune cells, compete with the cancer cells for nutrients, such as glucose, amino acids, and fat. But because tumors tend to have very poor blood supply, the new, there's actually very low nutrient levels, and so there's metabolic stress, not just for the cancer, but also for the immune cells. And this leads to immunosuppression in the tumor. And so the, can the immune cells are not able to do their job of killing off the cancer cells. And this is quite a, a, quite a big area of uh, research at the moment. Um, and actually, although there's been great strides forward in developing treatments to um, augment the immune system to, to attack cancer in, in the context of breast cancer as well as other cancers, there's also growing evidence that actually it's, the immune response plays a large part in, the terms of, in terms of how chemotherapy works. So we know, for example, that if you have a lot of immune cells sitting in your breast cancer and you're treated with the chemotherapy before surgery, which is a common way that we do things in breast cancer, uh, then you're much more likely to have this thing called a pathologic complete response, which is essentially there's no evidence of cancer in the breast after your chemotherapy, and that equals generally a very good prognosis. Um, uh, in other words, more immune cells, better in the cancer, better response. Uh, and so immune cells are almost certainly playing a large part in, in, in why your chemotherapy is working. And a while, quite a while ago, there was a study in diabetic breast cancer who were already on metformin and were receiving a chemotherapy before surgery, we often call it neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And these guys had a higher complete response rate in this small pilot study than the patients that weren't receiving metformin. Um, it's sort of a bit controversial, that statement, but that study suggested there may be something going on there. Anyway, we so in, we've now looked at our samples that we took in the Oxford study, and we've seen an increase in the numbers of some immune cells, for example, here, CDA-positive immune cells, which are quite important in, in, in uh, um, targeting cancer cells, killing off cancer cells, uh, one, in, the, in, in the biopsies, the samples that we've taken after two weeks of metformin treatment. We also saw that there was sort of the, the um, uh, character of the immune cells in the tumour varied after metformin to a more anti-cancer um, phenotype or character. Uh, and, and we saw that a different group of, so th these, sorry, I should say, are uh, lymphocytes, variant T-cells, 
type of lymphocyte, very uh, a type of white blood cell is very important in terms of uh, uh, killing off cancer cells. But we also saw there were an increase in the number of these uh, type of white blood cell macrophages that have also been um, uh, shown to be key in terms of generating immune response to, to cancers. Uh, so, in summary, and this is still unpublished data, uh, and that Stephen Beard has done a lot of work on animal models to show similar effects, and is teasing out sort of the mechanism there. Um, but it, 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 it's, it, there may be potential uh, to use metformin, for example, as an adjunct to immunotherapy agents that, or drugs that switch on the immune system to, to synergize. Um, so I've, I've talked about some work that we've published and some work that's near to publication. Now I'm going to talk about work that we're going to do next. Um, so uh, um, we've also got interest in metformin, not just as a treatment for cancer, and I think actually, as I've shown you, some of the data for met using metformin as a treatment for cancer overall today has been disappointing in the big clinical trials. But there's still quite a lot of interest in using metformin as a cancer preventative agent. Because, of course, the, the story actually started off from epidemiological studies suggesting that diabetic patients had lower incidence of cancer, not that it could treat cancer per se. Um, and probably the first area that, that's been looked at in detail is Lee-Pramani syndrome. So Lee-Pramani is the commonest inher inherited cancer predisposition syndrome. Uh, and if you have Lee-Pramani, uh, your risk of cancer by the age of 60 is pretty much 100%. And most patients, um, people with Lee Pramania will get cancers in there by the age of 30, 40. Uh, it's caused by a mutation in this gene called P53, such that that gene doesn't function properly. Uh, P53 is a tumor suppressor uh, gene, uh, and it's very important in controlling cell growth and cell death. And if, if you have if, if, you, if you have loss of this gene uh, in your cells, then you're, you're, you're likely to get a number of different cancers. That includes sarcomas, breast cancer, uh, lymphoma, leukemia, and, and, and adrenal gland cancers. Uh, it, it's, a really, it's a really important gene, and it regulates a whole lot of different processes. And that includes, includes uh, metabolic process, processes, including mitochondrial uh, metabolism. Because cell growth requires you to cells to alter their metabolism to uh, make more molecules to, to build more cells uh, and also to generate more energy. So it's not a surprise that P53 uh, is important in regulating those processes and actually when it's active in terms of switching them off. Um, and uh, this guy, Paul Huang, has done a lot of work um, showing that metformin might have potential in the lab showing that. And some early pilot work showing that, that metformin may have potential uh, as a cancer preventative in the Ibrahimi. So Paul Pine is based over in um, the NIH, in, in uh, the National Institute for Health in, in the US. Uh, and firstly, he showed that uh, in Ibrahimi patients, as well as in um, uh, uh, <coughs> cells in general, that you see increased oxygen consumption, increased mitochondrial activity. Um, Besides showing that in patients, he showed you could suppress that with metformin. So you, uh, and that was also in patients. So if you gave leave around many patients metformin, you could suppress the oxygen consumption of uh, white blood cells that have been taken from those patients and also muscle cells that have been biopsied from those patients. Uh, and then lastly, he, he, he's also shown that um, in this figure on the right, that uh, mice that have had P53 genetically engineered out of them, or mutant P53, a non-function P53 inserted in, uh, that metformin um, uh, improved survival of these mice, because they, they, these mice are much more will, will get cancers, mouse cancers very early on. But if you give them metformin, then you can improve their survival. Um, and so, uh, in Oxford, uh, Sarah Blackton, uh, and Myself uh, uh, designed this thing, the trial called the MINI trial, which is there to test the hypothesis does metformin prevent cancers in patients with Libra? Uh, and there's another trial that's just been funded by the NIH in the US, 
it's going to be a little bit larger, uh, but we, uh, we've been working with those guys quite closely such that uh, we'll be able to combine the data sets from these two trials. Uh, so we should have data set of about 700 patients in all, which is a decent size in this fairly rare condition. Um, and this is a design of the study. So patients with leaf romaine will be approached by the local cancer genetics team. They'll um, be randomized to either have five years of metformin or, or no metformin, 125 patients in each group. And they'll have yearly whole body MRI uh, to look for cancers and also uh, blood tumor markers uh, taken as well on a yearly basis. Um, and recently, I we have been funded to uh, collect blood samples from this trial to, to determine how we might select patients that might benefit from that form. And we'll just do that baseline then after, after 12 months. Uh, and these are the questions that we want to answer in this study. So firstly, does baseline or change in insulin levels on metformin predict benefit uh, from metformin and leafromaining? Uh, do the changes in gene expression based on our previous work in, in the breast cancer study I, I showed you, um, but in this case, you know, changes in gene expression in white blood cells, does this predict benefit from, from metformin? Can we generate a, a gene signature that will tell us which patients are likely to benefit? Uh, and then lastly, we want to ascertain um, uh, or under, understand better metformin's mechanism action in the Ukraine. Is it Again, the maximum effort is it the activity action on, on patient metabolism or, or patient mitochondria that might drive the, the anti cancer effect? Um, first patient in that study so should, should go in in January 2023. So I'll come back in four, about five years' time and I'll tell you, tell you the results. That's uh, uh, I'm quite excited about it. Um, so lastly, I'm going to touch on um, another story, which I admit I haven't had a lot to do with, giving a bit of advice now and again, but I think it's quite interesting. Uh, it's all being led, out, led from Oxford, uh, which is repurposing this drug, Tobacrope, to try and uh, augment radiotherapy. Uh, now the background to this is that uh, we know that low oxygen levels are very common in cancers. Uh, that's because, again, a bit like low nutrient levels, it's very poor blood supply, so it just doesn't penetrate the tumour properly. Uh, and actually, uh, this guy, Louis Harold Gray, showed back in the 1950s that uh, if you have low oxygen levels, or hypoxia, as it's otherwise known, of course, uh, this would affect the outcome of uh, radiotherapy in a deleterious way. Um, uh, we, so hypoxic tumour cells are known to have three times as more radio-resistant, um, resistance to radiotherapy in the tumor cells that are sitting at normal oxygen <coughs> levels. And this is because radio, the way radiotherapy works is, is it damages the DNA of cancer tissue uh, leading to cell death. But if you've got um, uh, uh, um, high levels of oxygen, decent levels of oxygen there, um, uh, this has a chemical reaction with the DNA strands that makes it much more difficult for the cells to repair and therefore they're more likely to die off from the radiotherapy. But if you've got low oxygen levels, they're much more able to resist that uh, and repair their DNA and survive. And there have been many different ideas as to how one might be able to target hypoxia for cancer treatment uh, such that you can make radiotherapy work better but also make chemotherapy work better because there's evidence that chemotherapy cancer cells are more resistant to chemotherapy if they have no oxygen levels. So some of these things have been to increasing oxygen supply, so people have tried to put people in oxygen tents and things before their radiotherapy didn't seem to work, but people have tried that. Uh, decreasing oxygen demand, which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, uh, because if the cancer cells and the other tissue are taking up less oxygen, then there's more oxygen in the environment. In the environment. And then also uh, various drugs that have been developed to hit the different uh, uh, pathways that are switched on um, in the context of low oxygen have been shown to be important in um, uh, radio resistance and developing resistance to radiotherapy. But probably the key ones actually, as I mentioned earlier, is just making sure you have as much oxygen as you can uh, in the cancer when you give that radiotherapy. So um, 
Two groups in Oxford work together, uh, Higgins and McKenna groups in pharmacology, uh, to screen pretty much every uh, well, a large number of the FDA approved drugs that are out there, not just cancer drugs, but other drugs. Um, using this machine, a seahorse machine, which can detect chips, very sensitive at detecting changes in oxygen consumption in, in cancer cells, and see which one of, which, which of those uh, drugs that are already used in patients quite routine for the various indications, could suppress oxygen consumption the most. Uh, it took about two years to do that, because they went through six, <laughs> almost 2,000 drugs. Um, and anyway, the top hit, the bottom line is, that it was the top, uh, the top hit of the top of the uh, which is an anti-malaria drug. Uh, and of course, they then went on to look in the lab in various models, you know, plate-based uh, cancer cell models, and then also in animals to show that it markedly augmented radiotherapy in that context. But it's never quite the same looking at it in an animal as a patient. You know, cancers in, pain in humans tend to be a lot bigger than the mouse, of course, uh, and therefore they're more likely to be hypoxic and uh, much more uh, um, uh, difficult to target with radiotherapy. Um, so the next step was to determine, well, can a topoquane, do we see decreased levels of oxygen, uh, oh, sorry, increased levels of oxygen in patients uh, that are uh, uh, taking a topoquane in, in their tubes? And so they, they, they set up this trial called the ATOM trial, in which they um, uh, treated patients with lung cancer. Uh, they gave two weeks of topoquane, uh, 15 patients and then 15 patients had no top and then they had surgery. You can see there's no radiotherapy in this trial. They just wanted to see there's a scroll for the top of quote, uh, uh, increase oxygen levels in the cancer. And so what the, the main way they did that was by using this thing called F MISO PET CT. So they carried one out of baseline and then just before their surgery. Uh, and then they also took a sample, used their diagnostic biopsy sample, and they compared that to the sample that was taken in the surgery. But the key thing was the imaging. Uh, and um, they use this thing called S-MISO because it gets trapped in hypoxic cells, but not cells uh, that have decent oxygen levels. Uh, and the top of them reduced F-MISO uptake in the lung cancer. You can see that up here, uh, that the, these are the top of quote patients that all, almost all of them had decreased F-MISO uptake, i.e. they had it's good evidence that they had higher oxygen levels in their tumors. Um, uh, they also looked at the, they also carried out sequencing of the genes from the tumor samples at baseline and after and at surgery after they've just finished their topoquone, and there was reduced expression of a whole bunch of hypoxia-related uh, genes in the patients that had received a topoquone, again suggesting that those tumors are less hypoxic. So this was this is uh, very sort of exciting. Uh, it was published about a year ago. And now they're carrying out the next study, which is where they're looking to try and combine this drug with radiotherapy. Um, but in this study, uh, I should say radiotherapy and chemotherapy, because in lung cancer you tend to give chemotherapy and radiotherapy together. Um, but in this study, they're, 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 they want to see if they can push the dose of the tolerquone such that they can get. Um, even better, uh, also greater increases in, in the oxygen levels in, in, in the tumors in patients. Because in the first day, they just used the standard dose that you use in malaria, as a, or as a malaria preventative. But in this study, uh, but, but in cancer patients, we can, dare I say, for a short burst of treatment, uh, you can often accept, shall we say, side effects that would be more of an issue if you're taking a drug on hold later than yourself getting malaria. Um, so, we, 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 it, it, in, in this study, we want to, as I say, we want to push, or the team want to push the dose to see if they can increase the sort of pharmacogenetic effects of the, 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 the drug, improve, increase the oxygen levels, thereby potentially make the radiotherapy work better. Um, so, this study is ongoing, uh, sort of halfway through, expected to end in the next 12 months. And then, after this trial, what would expect? Sort of a late phase trial where you're giving a top of to patients at the optimized dose uh, and scientific clinical outcome.
uh, if you give it to, say, a patient with lung cancer, radical chemotherapy therapy with curative intent, are you curing more patients if you give the atomic drug? But this is kind of, I think the reason I showed this at the end is this is really sort of an exemplar way to do things in a consistent, with a consistent approach. Excellent lab work at the beginning, early work to just determine how is your job working in patients, is it doing what you expect it to do, then optimising the dose, the next step will be to, to launch a big study and determine does it actually benefit patients. But if you don't do all this work beforehand, you're mo much less likely to see uh, your big study uh, showing that you're engendering clinical benefit in patients. Um, so that's it really, uh, just to say, well, there, you know, old drugs can have remarkably, uh, can be remarkably effective for cancer treatment, as been shown in the film, my stories, uh, when they're repurposed. Um, but you need to do a lot of work beforehand. You can't just jump in with your big trial, because that's when you're, you, you, you often perhaps will find that you, you uh, spend a lot of money uh, and perhaps miss benefit when it actually exists. And lastly, these are the window of opportunity trial designs, by which I mean you put drug into patients before they have their uh, um, standard treatment and look in that short window of two to four weeks can tell you a lot of information about how the drugs are working in patients. Uh, these are uh, just acknowledgements to all the people that uh, worked on these studies. Um, and then uh, I'd just like to thank all the funders that have helped this work. I'm open to questions.